It's my pleasure, though, to be here tonight to talk about uh, technology and specifically what our technology department is doing in terms of cybersecurity for our district. And that's, you know, the infrastructure, our network, right down to the hardware and the actual devices we use. So, you know, cybersecurity is a hot topic, as Dr. Sargent said, and in every industry, right, in life, we're all aware of it. A hot topic that it is, there is very little in terms of like a roadmap telling you what to actually do. There's no list of instructions, do this, then this, then this. There are like, make sure you're doing something in the area of this and something in the area of this. Um, so that makes it a little challenging, but also a little interesting. Um, the one thing that everyone agrees upon, I would say, the one idea everyone agrees upon is that when it comes to cyber threats, it really is more a matter of when and not if. And so what you wanna do is just be as well prepared as you can and make sure you're ready to respond as well as you can. And that's what, what we do. When I was thinking about how to go over this with you and share with you the things we, we do, I decided to use a framework from NIST. That's the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's a division of the United States Department of Commerce, actually. And that's a, a recognized framework of five areas where you should focus efforts in terms of cybersecurity. So I'll, I'll take you through those areas and be able to share with you specifically what we do here. Where's my, there it is, okay. So the first area is identify. And what you're doing here is just, you wanna make sure you have an understanding of what's at risk in your district. Where might you be vulnerable? So to that end, we identify the critical systems that our district requires for operations. What do we need to have running to open school? You know, Genesis, uh, Versatrans, things like that and in, in the buildings and maintenance departments like Honeywell or HVAC systems, things like that. What are the critical systems? Um, we have worked with, it's an ongoing thing with our uh, curriculum office, it's quite a task, to create a software inventory for all instructional applications and software. And that's pretty big, especially in a, in a world where there's a lot of free stuff too, and so teachers are accessing free things in addition to things we're budgeting for and purchasing, and we're trying to keep an eye on and monitor all of these programs and all of these things that are happening. It is a lot, um, but we are working with the curriculum office to keep this inventory maintained, add to it, take away from it, who's in charge of it, what, what budget line is it coming out of if it's you know purchased. So that's another way we're identifying systems in our district that could be at risk or could uh, bring in maybe a problem. We maintain a, asset, a hardware asset management system and we track all the hardware that we will give to users in our district or put into buildings and facilities in our district. Um, peripherals like monitors, projectors, access points, wireless access points. We have that um, down to who is it assigned to, who is responsible for it, things like that. So we are identifying all of those important components where we could be vulnerable. The next area is protect. And this is important and we do a lot in this area. Um, we employ the principle of least privilege and, and what that means is that anyone with access to a system should have the least access they need to do their jobs. You shouldn't just say, oh, you need to do X, I'll just give you the whole alphabet in there and you, X will be in there. You know, you want to keep it to what you actually need. Um, and we annually review those things. The, the uh, administrators of each system are making sure that we're doing that. And sometimes, you know, someone needs to see something, say, in Genesis, and they're coming to me to say, can you give access to this particular part of Genesis for this time frame, and we're keeping track of turning it on and turning it off. That's what least privilege means. Um, in, in coordination with our HR department and our information systems, we have an automated system for onboarding and offboarding employees, right down to the day they need the access to when that access ends. 
Um, and it, it, you know, gone are the days of like, oh, they still have an account there? We didn't, they've been <laughs> retired for five years. You know, that doesn't happen anymore because we are really very careful about doing that in conjunction, like I said, with HR and information systems. Um, we've implemented Google two-step verification for all district employees for any of our programs that use our Google logins. We have multiple air-gapped backups of critical systems. What that means, in, in simple terms, I feel like all I ever request is like, give me the layman's term, you know, <laughs> please. Uh, so air-gapped just means that there is a gap between these two things. So if you're, all of your, uh, your serve, say you have a big server here, right, with so much important information, you want to be backing that up periodically. Well, those backups are gapped so that here's a backup from two hours ago. Now something hits this whole thing and all of that data is um, corrupted. Well, I have this from two hours ago at least that did not touch that. There's a gap there. It's not touching it so it can't get, the bad stuff can't get to it. Um, and we do that. We have multiple air gaps so that if we did have some kind of attack on the main system, we have a backup that's not that old that we can work from and just sort of fill in whatever we might have missed when we lost the other data. Uh, our critical systems all run at an offsite co-location facility. So we had moved our uh, systems over there a couple of years ago. And you know the primary reason for a co-location, many industries use them. Uh, they're big facilities that just house servers for all types of organizations, um, is really the physical part of it. You know, uh, it's climate controlled and you want to control all for all of natural disasters and things. Um, but also, it is protection. You know, it's 24-7 guarded and you can't just walk in. There's a, a very uh, strict uh, or restrictive, I should say, identification process to even get in there, to get to our spot. You know, it's not easy. So a bad actor, a literal physical person who's a bad actor, can't just go to one of our servers or one of our devices or something in our district and like try to put something in there with a USB stick or something. This is a way and very heavily guarded. So that is also a step to protect us. Inbound, outbound network traffic is monitored by a firewall, which does just that. It watches all of what's coming in and going out on our network to make sure it's all okay. Are uh, any Mac and Windows devices in our district that we own that we give out of endpoint protection, which is just at the endpoint with the end user, there's like antivirus software and things like that to protect that very device. Um, we maintain a schedule for deploying critical patches and updates, just like you do updates on your phones and things. We do that in a on a larger scale. Uh, we transitioned our staff devices over to Chromebooks to mitigate a risk they are less vulnerable because they don't have things installed on them and so it's less likely, uh, you know, not foolproof, but less likely that you'll get something onto one of those devices. And we do in the district require all of our employees to complete monthly training on cybersecurity specifically. It's a video program, you take a little quiz at the end, it's like less than five minutes. And we do monthly phishing simulation campaigns. So we try to fish, we try to get someone to, we don't want them to click, but it's just us testing if they'll click the link and fall for it. Um, and so we can monitor where now to provide more training or what to focus more on when we're doing the videos. So that we do all of those things in order to, to protect our district. Okay, um, detect. So in the area of detect, when something you know would happen, how are we gonna identify that, oh boy, this is something that we need to worry about. We maintain and we monitor the firewall and the endpoint protection systems that I just mentioned. We uh, monitor those logs for any unusual activity, anything that, that needs our attention. The data flows, we manage the data flows. What that means is that we, um, we've created the data flows and we watch the data flows, meaning we tell uh, Genesis what to send to Google Classroom. We tell it what to do and we monitor to make sure that it is doing it properly. So we tell the systems how to communicate with one another and we manage that. When, when something's not working properly or, or a teacher's not seeing something, we'll go look and see why that's happening. 
Um, and hopefully it's never for a cybersecurity reason, it's for a different reason, but that's what that means about data flows. System to system, we set up that flow. And we've developed a district incident response plan, which you'll hear more about. Um, in the beginning when I said there's no roadmap for this, there's no instructions, and one of the things everyone loves to say is that you need an incident response plan. But believe me when I tell you, you can't just go find an incident response plan very easily. Uh, certainly not for schools, never found one, and really never found one in any other industry, but we were able to kind of piece together um, from another government agency, uh, I guess more like a, a helpful outline of the areas you should be focusing on, and within those outlines, we made our own steps. And so we know, what are we gonna do first? What are we gonna do next? And that's what I get to here on this, in the respond area. How would we respond with our incident response plan? So you'd start with triage, right? And we do this every day all the time. It could be as simple as someone reporting an email to us as possible phishing. And you know, we'll take a look at it and we'll be able to determine yes or no, or you know, and communicate with that end user as to what they really saw or what we need to do. And sometimes it's nothing. And so the triage just, you know, the process ends at triage, right? But the incident response plan, of course, has to go further than that. And so then if it were something, we would move into event classification. Um, and that is where we would use these sort of government uh, categories. Is this a low, a medium, or a high risk thing? Is this a, a big deal or is this something we'll just fix over here and, and no big deal? We then will coordinate with any stakeholders we need to. Hopefully it's not escalated to the point of needing to talk to insurance, but we would do that if we needed to. The vendor of the particular software or application or whatever that's been compromised. Um, and you know, when I see the insurance, I just think to always mention too, I mention this to our staff all the time when you know, they don't want to hear me anymore about cybersecurity. I say, you know, we confirm, we say to our insurance company, yes, we are doing these things. We, we are obligated to protect our district. And so when I see that, I always hope it never gets to the point where I have to then talk to these people on, about an incident. But it is important and something, it's reality. It's part of it if anything should happen. So if it got to that, we would have to talk to all of those people and certainly are in district stakeholders, um, analysis of the event. So you're, you're in the middle of this now and you really have to get to the bottom of how to fix it. What are we gonna do to get everything back? How are we gonna contain it? What does it involve? What, how far did it go? That's the analysis stage. Eradication is fixing it, right? Uh, Re-imaging or, or um, repairing the, the broken system over here, or the broken data flow, or the, uh, uh, I don't wanna say like attack, attacked data flow. We wanna make sure that we are repairing to finally recover, okay? And then in recovery, we are resetting passwords, and we are making, testing systems, and are we flowing okay now? Are there no roadblocks? Is everything working fine? We're debriefing with one another. These are all built into those steps of the incident response plan. And then finally, a whole recovery uh, area that I was just alluding to. When you wanna get there, it's very important, or when you are there, it's very important to make sure you're recovering fully and debriefing is really important too. But I named some of the uh, things you would do to test the district system, to reset the passwords, as I mentioned, perform any updates or patches needed, test all the systems, and debrief about the lessons learned, which is always important in, in everything we do in schools, even you know when you were in, when I was in a building, you know, debriefing is always great after any sort of crisis situation because you're gonna learn a lot and you're gonna be better prepared for the next time. And certainly part of that too, if, uh, you know, depending on the magnitude of the event, uh, we would be following district public, public relations procedures regarding any communications out of the district about what happened or what we do next. That would be part of our recovery as well. So like I said, you're never, you know, a thousand percent 
uh, ready or prepared, but I think we, we do a lot very well in terms of making sure we're, we're ready. But where do we go from here, right? So we want to continue doing the things we're doing, uh, certainly. Um, when I was talking about what we do with curriculum and all the, the, all the uh, software and we're inventorying and we keep trying to manage it all, what we eventually will try to do, um, and it is built into the technology plan that I shared with the communications committee uh, a month or so ago, is to include all of our district systems in that inventory, because it's not just those instructional things. It's VersaTrans, it's SchoolFi, it's, it's all of these different things, the lunch, everything, the Honeywell, the HVAC, anything that is interacting with our network, we'd like to get a very big database of and be able to identify them should there be any, any issues. Um, annual penetration tests, we've done penetration tests, um, but I would like to see this become an annual thing. Uh, of course, there's a cost associated with it. You basically have a company try to get in. They try to attack you and, and see where your vulnerabilities are so you can make any necessary improvements. So I, I, that's something we'd like to see happen uh, down the line. And finally, review policies for cybersecurity. You know, uh, and Joni will agree with me, we couldn't even find policies on cybersecurity for school districts. I mean, they're just not there. That's what I, what I mean when I said there was no roadmap. That is something I would like to either build into existing policy or look to maybe be the first ones to actually write one that's just a cybersecurity policy. But it, it should get in there a little more, even in our existing policies, more than what it is now, because it's like barely there. And that's pretty much it for me, but I will take any questions.